Hello there and good evening and welcome to All24 Nightly News coming to you live from Algiers. I'm your host Kirin Fazakri and up next are the top stories. In the aftermath of the deadly Moroccan quake, rising death toll, desperate search for survivors and families struggle through second night in the open. And in connected news, Algeria extends support to Morocco after reopening airspace, deploys aid and earns Arab League praise for authentic response. Also coming up, Sahrawi government urges UN action for self-determination amidst Moroccan foreign ministry statement. Also ahead, military council in Niamey accuses France of troop deployment in West Africa. Macron cites, or cites request by deposed president. And United States and Vietnam forge comprehensive strategic partnership in response to China's changing global role. Biden rejects isolation approach. Hello again and thank you for joining us. First off in our topical news, rescue efforts persist for a second consecutive day in earthquake-hit regions of Morocco. The Ministry of Interior reports over 2,000 fatalities and 2,000 injuries. Search and rescue teams focus on reaching remote and mountainous areas affected by the quake. Zara Jenny has the full story. It's been difficult 35 hours since the heart-wrenching earthquake rocked the Moroccan kingdom, leaving devastation in its wake. Buildings crumbled, claiming the lives of over 2,000 souls, while another 2,400 remain critically injured, teetering on the edge of survival. The aftermath of this seismic juggernaut has rendered countless Moroccans homeless. In Marrakesh, citizens find themselves spending their second night under the open sky, hearts heavy with grief, their ears tuned to the ominous rumblings of possible aftershocks. Almost 31 persons died here. Yesterday we used all our effort to help and rescue people here. We did what we could, but for many other people, we could not help them. So they stayed under rubble. They could not breathe. We helped one person to let them breathe, but many other people died. We could not help them. In quake-stricken Moroccan villages, grief-stricken residents wasted no time hastily burying their loved ones who had been painstakingly extricated from the rubble that now defines their once thriving communities. We believe in God's destiny. My sister, her daughters and her husband passed away. May God have mercy on them. We are located in this village in a very remote area. A whole family of six people died as victims of the earthquake. Everyone is afraid. Six individuals died. May God have mercy on them. Described as the most ferocious tumbler in decades, experts warn that the toll may soar even higher. The rescue efforts in the worst-hit mountainous regions prove to be an intricate and arduous task, leaving us with an uncertain and somber outlook for the days to come. The International Red Crescent and Red Cross have characterized Morocco's earthquake-related emergency aid requirements as immense. Hossama Sharkawi, the director of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in the Middle East and North Africa, anticipates that meeting international relief appeals will necessitate months, if not years, to secure funding from donor parties for their reconstruction endeavors in the affected areas. The United Nations, in response to the devastating Moroccan earthquake on Friday, pledged immediate humanitarian assistance and expressed readiness to assess long-term reconstruction needs. Deputy spokesman Farhan Haq stated that the UN is prepared to assist upon request, emphasizing the current focus now is providing humanitarian aid to the affected individuals. 
at this stage, we'll need to see uh, whether uh, there is uh, a greater need for reconstruction, including in uh, the historic district. Uh, as you know, there's a, a heritage site uh, in Marrakesh, and we'll have to see whether that needs to be uh, uh, protected further. But long-term reconstruction issues will have to wait. First, we need to make sure that people get the humanitarian aid that they need. Still with the same file, the earthquake in Morocco disrupted water and electricity supply in the affected areas, particularly in the Atlas Mountains. The Ministry of Equipment and Water confirmed no damage to dams, but reported road blockages from debris slides. In Moulay Ibrahim, the quake's epicenter, rescue teams work around the clock to find survivors and recover bodies from flattened homes. Let's follow more details with Selma Nassib. A rare and mighty earthquake rocked Morocco, jolting people from their slumber, bringing ancient cities and mountain villages to their knees. In Amizmiz village, a rescue camp built to shelter merely a dozen is cradling many surviving families, including little ones left high and dry, without food, water nor power, as aid providers are battling blocked roads. Amizmiz is suffering. No bread and no electricity and no water. People are suffering and aid is late. Some are stuck in roads. Some lack food and shelter. We're 12 or 13 in the tent, including kids and parents. The situation is dire. Near the epicenter in Moulay Ibrahim, some 40 kilometers from Marrakesh, the devastation is grim. Rescue crews race against the clock, hunting for survivors, and they're falling beneath the ruins of homes. Yassin Numgar made dinner with the quake hit. Watch his house crumble before his eyes. This is where we were sitting for our dinner. Like in five seconds, it's happening. As you can see, our house is damaged. Everything is gone. We lost everything. We lost the entire house. There are no officials visiting us. There's no help or aid. This is the will of God. Nearby, Hossein Adnai, another resident, was seen seeking clothes and blankets for his street-bound family. There are still people buried in this house. They didn't get the rescue they needed, so they died. I rescued my children, and I'm trying to get covers for them and anything to wear from the house. After Morocco's deadliest quake in six decades, survivor grapple for sustenance and shelter. Relief efforts rushed to Moulay Ibrahim with trucks and loading precious cargo, promising food and water for the better town's residents. <laughs> Algeria, in response, has offered an emergency plan to assist Morocco to the recent powerful earthquake. The Algerian Foreign Ministry's official spokesperson announced that Algeria will initiate this plan upon Morocco's acceptance of the logistical and material aid it has prepared. The assistance includes an 80-member civil defense team, a specialized search and rescue squad, a medical team, and humanitarian supplies like first aid kits, mattresses, and tents. Secretary General of the Arab League, Ahmed Abu Ghaid, praised Algeria's supportive stance toward the Moroccan people following the earthquake. In a post on his official social media account on the X platform, he commended Algeria's solidarity, which encompassed opening airspace and expressing readiness to provide assistance. Arab League foreign ministers also praised Algerian President Abdelmajid Taboun's initiative to strengthen Arab cooperation, especially regarding the Palestinian cause during their 160th session in Cairo. They also commended his proposals for Arab League reform, recognized Algeria's role in promoting Arab unity, and applauded his efforts to promote Palestinian unity, welcoming the Algiers declaration from a reunification conference. The ministers expressed satisfaction with Palestinian parties' commitment to implement it within set timelines and thanked Algeria for its significant support, including 153 million US dollars for the state of Palestine's budget and 30 million US dollars for Jenin camp reconstruction after actions by Zionist occupation forces. 
On Sunday, Algerian President Abdel Majid Tabun met with Nour al-Din bin Brahim, the head of the National Observatory of Civil Society, along with his team. The meeting, attended by Nadir al arbawi director of the Algerian Presidency's office, and Boalem Boalem, the Algerian President's advisor for legal and judicial affairs, focused on reviewing the activities of the organization and gathering proposals and insights related to its re or responsibilities in civil society oversight. To a different news now, the Sahrawi Foreign Ministry reiterated that the only viable resolution to the Western Sahara conflict must align with the United Nations Charter and the African Union Constitutive Law. Responding to the Moroccan Foreign Ministry statement, which the Sahrawi Ministry deemed a colonial approach with opening delays or ongoing delays, I'm saying, it emphasized that resolving the Western Sahara issue necessitates granting the Sahrawi people their undeniable and timeless right to self-determination and independence without any compromise. The Sahrawi government, while reiterating its condemnation of the dangerous escalation trend of the Moroccan occupying state and warning of its devastating repercussions on peace, security and stability in the entire region, reaffirms that the only solution to the conflict in Western Sahara is the one that is consistent with the Charter of the United Nations and the Constitutive Act of the African Union, which stipulate the empowerment of the people. The Sahrawi government also urged the UN Security Council to take full responsibility of expediting the or enabling the Manorso mission to fulfill its mandate in accordance with the UN African Settlement Plan. The Sahrawi government calls on the UN Security Council to bear full responsibility in accelerating and enabling the United Nations mission for the referendum in Western Sahara, Minurso, to carry out its mandate assigned to it, which is to organize a self-determination referendum for the Sahrawi people in accordance with the 1991 African United Nations Settlement Plan, which was signed by parties to the conflict and the ratification of the UN Security Council. To other topical news in Africa, the Niamey Military Council accused France of deploying forces in West African countries, suggesting it's a prelude to an attack on Niger. President Macron clarified that the French troop redeployment in Niger followed a request from the ousted President Bazoum. Subsequently, Niger's military council lodged a complaint against France and the economic community of West African states, a.k.a. ACOWAS, with the UN Security Council. Here's Osama Ayadi with more. Tensions between Niger's military leaders and former colonial power France keep on escalating, casting a shadow over Niger's already fragile and security landscape. The Nigerian Military Council accuses France of deploying troops across West African nations, hinting at possible intervention with ICWAS. In a televised communique, Niger's military leadership reiterated its demand to French troops to vacate its territory. It should be pointed out to the national and international public opinion that, since the announcement of this withdrawal plan, France has continued to deploy its forces in several ECOWAS countries as part of the preparations for an aggression against Niger that it is planning in collaboration with this community organization. For his part, President Emmanuel Macron responds emphasizing that any troop deployment would only occur in coordination with with President Mohamed Bazoum. French forces have been deployed on Niger's soil at Niger's request, and we are there to fight against terrorism at Niger's request and its democratically elected bodies. We are demanding the release of President Bazoum and the rehabilitation of the constitutional order. President Bazoum has not renounced to his power, and so, if we ever redeploy, I would do so only at the request of President Bazoum and in coordination with him. In an interesting twist of events, Niger's military council filed a complaint to the UN Security Council, alleging that ICWA sanctions violate international law, at the same time accusing France of jeopardizing Niger's peace and security. The government of Niger calls on the Secretary General of the United Nations to immediately stop the French Republic from its aggressive actions against Niger, in case this situation continues, which undermines the stability and security of our country. The government of Niger reserves the right to use self-defense, in accordance with Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations.
Indeed, the rift between Niger and France continued to deepen as Paris deems the military coup leader as illegitimate. Yet the anti-French sentiment prevails in the country, where the majority seems in support of their military, mirroring neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso's moves to severe military ties with France. This comes as many initiatives arise to find a peaceful resolution to the crisis to avert the entire region's severe repercussions. In anticipation of an impending hurricane, Libya has temporarily shut down four major oil ports for a three-day period. These ports include Ras Al Anouf, Zwaitina, Briga and Sidra. Libya, North Africa's largest oil producing nation, has faced political and military unrest that resulted in frequent oil field closures, leading to erratic production. The country aims to boost production to 8% by December reaching levels not seen in over a decade. Elsewhere in Africa, in Sudan, the death toll resulting from Sudanese army airstrike on neighborhoods in southern Khartoum on Sunday has climbed to at least 40 people amid the ongoing conflict with the rapid support forces. The local resistance committee reported the casualties from what it termed the Guru Market massacre in the May region due to aerial bombardment. They anticipate the number may rise as more injured individuals continue to arrive at Al Bashair Hospital in the capital, Khartoum. The committee initially reported 30 deaths and numerous injuries from the military aircraft's bombing at the Kuru Market area around 7.15 a.m. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed declared the completion of the fourth and final mobilization of the Renaissance Dam, a source of tension with Egypt and Sudan, following two weeks of negotiations between the three countries. Mili Salam, a spokesperson for the Ethiopian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, had previously stated that the fourth fill-in would proceed as planned, aiming for a mutually satisfying resolution. To the Middle East now, in occupied Palestine, the Ministry of Health reported the tragic death of Milad Mundir Arai, a 16-year-old child who was shot by Zionist occupation forces at the entrance of the Al Arub camp in northern Al Khalil. According to local sources cited by the Palestinian news agency, Zionist soldiers fired live bullets and toxic tear gas canisters at young men and children in the area. Milad, a young shepherd, sustained gunshot wounds to the back and was rushed to Al Yamam Hospital in Bethlehem, where doctors later confirmed his martyrdom. Within the same file on Sunday, clashes erupted between Palestinians and Zionist occupation forces in Al Arub camp, North Al Khalil, shortly after the funeral of the young martyr Milad Arai. The Palestinian news agency reported that Zionist forces deployed sound and gas bombs against young individuals at the camp's entrance. They also sealed off the entrance, prohibiting people from entering or exiting through the main gate. Two different news now. India managed to get the desperate G20 group to sign off on a final statement despite pointed disagreements among powerful members, mostly over Russia's actions in Ukraine. And climate issues were also sidestepped. More in this report. The G20 summit in New Delhi defied expectations on Sunday as world leaders managed to reach a consensus on a joint declaration, but not without making a comprises, particularly on the Ukraine conflict and action on climate change. The surprise consensus was a stark departure from the weeks leading up to the summit, during which sharply contrasting views on the Ukraine conflict threatened to derail the meeting. Faced with the looming risk of a significant diplomatic setback, host nation India worked diligently to coax members into agreeing on a common statement that toned down its earlier condemnation of the Ukrainian war. Russia, for its part, hailed the G20 summit as a success, with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov echoing the sentiment. 
Let me say briefly that the summit is of course an unquestionable success, first of all for the Indian presidency, but also for all of us. The G20 is experiencing, I would say, internal reform. First of all, this was manifested in the significant activation of the members of the G20 from the Global South, who, with the leading role of India, very clearly and persistently sought to take into account their interests in the agreements that the G20 discussed, and as a result, they were included in the final declaration. However, despite extensive discussions, leaders failed to come to an agreement on a phased reduction of fossil fuels. This failure occurred even in the wake of a United Nations report released just a day earlier, which had underscored the critical importance of such reduction in achieving net zero emissions. French President Emmanuel Macron expressed disappointment, deeming the G20's efforts insufficient in addressing this pressing concern. Le bilan mondial. The global assessment of the Paris Agreement was published on Friday. We're not on the right track. To achieve this, we need to step up our commitments. And the G20 is a key player in this respect. But in this respect, I want to say that it's not enough. And I, for one, am very concerned about the spirit that is beginning to prevail, including, by the way, among the members of the G20, on the climate issue. It is worth noting that China said it's ready to strengthen communication and cooperation to work with Europe. In successfully hosting the China-European Union summit this year, this comes after the Group of 20 Nations agreement to grant the African Union permanent membership status in the bloc, as was expected. Russia's defense ministry reported that its forces shut down eight drones launched by Ukraine over the Black Sea near the Crimean Peninsula and destroyed three other high-speed boats' waves in the seawaters in the early hours of Sunday morning. The ministry added via telegram that the American-made military speedboats were carrying Ukrainian military personnel and were destroyed northeast of Snake Island, while no damages nor injuries were reported. <clears throat> On Sunday, Ukrainian authorities reported that 32 Russian drones targeted Kiev, with 20 of them successfully intercepted. Serhii Popko, the head of Kiev's military administration, mentioned that swarms of drones entered the city from different directions, causing damage to an apartment, roads and power lines, resulting in one person being injured. Furthermore, Ukraine revealed that its forces engaged in a challenging counterattack to reclaim territory from Russia, made progress on the southern front. Ukrainian Army Commander Oleksandr Tarnavesk stated that the defense forces advanced more than one kilometer in the Tavria region. U.S. President Joe Biden, while enhancing relations with Vietnam on Sunday, clarified that he does not intend to harm China. His goal is to strengthen trade ties while addressing various challenges, including human rights, climate issues, and GU economic com competition. Here's a slipstick. In Hanoi, President Joe Biden received a warm welcome, with school children waving American flags and honor guards carrying bayoneted rifles. He took part in a ceremony hosted by Vietnam's ruling Communist Party, making a deepening of ties between the U.S. and Vietnam as they elevate their relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. President Joe Biden and I, on behalf of both countries, have jointly agreed to elevate the relation between Vietnam and the United States to a comprehensive strategic partnership for peace, cooperation and sustainable development. We are vaulting our partnership directly to a comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam's highest tier of partnerships, and we're excited about that. During his meeting with Vietnam's leaders, President Biden emphasized the pivotal role both countries play in shaping the Indo-Pacific region for generations to come. This truly historic moment. Today, we can trace a 50-year arc of progress in the relationship between our nations, from conflict to normalization, to this new elevated status that will be uh, a force for prosperity and security in one of the most consequential regions in the world. 
Biden praised the progress in U.S.-Vietnam relations and other Asian nations, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. As for China and despite intense rivalry with Beijing, particularly in trade, he expressed a strong commitment to strengthening U.S.-China ties. I am sincere about getting the relationship right. And one of the things that is going on now is China's beginning to change some of the rules of the game uh, in terms of trade and other issues. As I said, I'm not, we're not looking to hurt China, sincerely. We're all better off if China does well. China does well by the international rules, grows the economy. President Biden also secured agreements with Vietnam on semiconductors and minerals, vital components in today's tech-driven world, recognizing its significance in securing global supply chains and reducing dependence on China. According to observers, semiconductors take center stage in action plan for during Biden's visit, highlighting the need to train skilled workers, addressing Vietnam's shortage of engineers in the chip sector, and by granting the U.S. the same diplomatic status as China and Russia. Vietnam aims to diversify its alliances, offering an attractive alternative to the U.S. and European companies, seeking alternatives to Chinese factories. The end of our program. Thank you for watching and goodbye.